masks off. The next session will be defeating authoritarianism, bottom-up best practices. Uh, please take your seat and enjoy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Novak. I'm an American-Hungarian reporter. I live in Budapest, and I, I write about Hungary. I'd like to introduce you all to what I think is probably going to be the most inter interesting discussion uh, we will have today. Um, as the title of this uh, discussion indicates, our panelists will be looking at the conditions that may or may not contribute to strategies by civil activists and politicians to affect change in um, authoritarian regimes. And we are very fortunate to have such a distinguished panel with us to help us explore this subject. They bring with themselves a comprehensive background, civil activism, international public law, advocacy, media, and public policy. And I look forward to seeing these backgrounds intersect in this fascinating discussion. And I think we'll start off here with a, a video remark by uh, Sergei Popovich. Hello, everybody. My name is Sergei Popovich. I am an executive director of Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategy based in Belgrade. And I'm happy to be today with you all by virtually on this great conference and uh, talking about a very important topic of defeating authoritarianism. Defeating authoritarianism is something I committed uh, most of my working life. I started as a young student building a movement named Otpor, Serbian word for resistance, in Serbia in the 90s that was uh, instrumental in the getting accountability to one of the worst dictators in Europe in the last century, Slobodan Milosevic, also known as Butcher of Balkan. Since then, uh, I've spent a lot of time traveling the world, trying to figure out how to help pro-democracy and human rights movements. And my organization runs a curriculum on it, and we're looking at the skills. And sometimes these movements were very impressive and very successful in developing their own skills or applying these skills. However, bad guys learn as well, whether you want to take a look at the book Dictator's Learning Curve by Will Dobson or a book by my friend Peter Pomerantsev, this is not propaganda, seems that across the globe authoritarians learned not only how to apply the skill set in order to oppress pro-democracy and human rights movements or squeeze public space even more, but in a digital era, use technology that we were all so thrilled about in 2011 during Arab Spring in order to surveil people, so ducts, satanize people, build troll farms or do the full-scale assault of truth. Some of the consequences of this assault of truth are unfortunately deadly in a time of pandemic if you take a look at the anti-vax and anti-mask movement across the globe. Also bad guys were capable of exporting this idea globally. So this is a very interesting moment in time. However, looking into how to defeat authoritarianism and looking into contemporary movements uh, for human rights, uh, equality, and uh, of course democracy, uh, we must take a look at the, another very interesting phenomenon. And that phenomenon is that there is a new breed of popular social movements popping out across the globe in the last decade or so. Uh, first of all, they are a different animals than the movements of our times where when you take a look at the labor rights you would expect a labor union being a backbone on it recruiting people going on marches and strikes and boycotts movements of nowadays are far more horizontal due to their nature and the social media channel of their of their spreading you'll find these movements being triggered by various events where this is corruption increase of of uh, uh, payments uh, where this is a uh, individual events like an assassination of George Floyd in the United States, they spread like wildfire, they spread across geography, they spread across the population, they spread across the age, and they're very difficult to repress or control. Another part uh, of this horizontality, uh, which is also a very important uh, feature of these new movements, is the ownership thing. Uh, organizations, established organizations, mainstream organizations don't own their movement. They come very often after the mobilization already happened and try to catch up with it. So you can't really pinpoint the organizers, which once again makes the movement difficult to oppress. It also comes with a very interesting agency of ownership. 
the more horizontal the movement, the more ownership the local leadership of the movement claim over its goals, and more likely that agency will be durable, because the more people do things themselves instead as a part of the organization, the more they're likely to feel like they are the leaders. The more leaders, the more agency, the more leaders, the more difficult to suppress, the more leaders, the more ideas. So all of this are the good sign. Uh, last but not of least importance, uh, the problem with these movements is uh, that they are very difficult to unify around the demands and they're very difficult to organize once they sparkle. Where we are looking at the clearness of demands of the of the different movements across the globe, where we are looking at, uh, at their strategy outlined on the websites and documents, they need to find a way to organize their decision-making process in order to reach consensus about what they really want. Also, they, uh, they are very vulnerable to the to the effects of the lack of nonviolent discipline. If you take a look at the BLM and hundreds of thousands of people marching in defense of human rights, and you take a look at what made the mode news, it's a small outbreak of the people who took the violent path in a places like Portland. So taking a look at this thing, probably the movements of future will be more horizontal, uh, with larger uh, element of ownership and uh, we need to find some kind of balance uh, between this horizontality and influx of new people, idea and local agency leadership and clear demands and nonviolent discipline. Another layer of this phenomenon which gives me hope for the future is the fact that the age of this movement is, is very young. If you take a look at the contemporary nonviolent movements, if you take a look at the world's largest and probably most important movement, the environmental one, you will see high schoolers leading it. That gives hope that in the future people will be keep their leaders accountable because this generation is going to grow, they're going to claim their voting rights, they're going to get engaged in business and politics, and here is the new generation coming. Uh, it would be it would be naive uh, not to take a look at the context of the post-pandemic world. All around the globe, the pandemic actually caused human rights and democracy to shrink. Even in a more democratic society, you see governments running by the decrees. In autocracy-aspiring societies like Hungary, you can see leaders seizing the opportunity to suspend or, or do dormate the parliament in order to execute their will without checks and balances. And everywhere around the world, the, the surveillance tools are used uh, supposedly to track Expo exposure to COVID, but in a places like Russia, this face recognition software, for example, is used to, to follow uh, the dissidents and repress them even more. Uh, movements came in immediately uh, with uh, tactical innovations, going more online, uh, making socially distanced protests, making car protests, but more important strategic innovations, finding the way to turn their human rights and pro-democracy work into the community work. And for example, in Malaysia or Hong Kong, you will find the former dissidents being super popular and super active in helping their neighbors survive the crisis, getting the shelter for those who can't shelter in place because they are homeless. If you take a look at the white flag movement in Malaysia, for example, uh, teaching people how to alert their harmlessness and teaching others how to help them. These are also very interesting transformations because then the governments are left with two bad choices. Oppress somebody who is doing community work or accept the fact that the people you hate are doing your work and thus showing that the government doesn't really work in a time of COVID. That brings us to the projections of future. Uh, these two things are connected. Uh, if you take a look at the Belarus, you had Lukashenko in power for more than two decades, but it's because his awful handle of COVID that the opposition finally found its unity and defeated him on the elections, which of course he, he forged and now in, we are in the middle of the political crisis. Uh, this COVID accountability bill is coming due and it will be coming due in the next year or so. So what we are going to see is more situations like with the right, right wing president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, where somebody who was unquestioned in power for years is actually very, very digging up their heels, defending themselves against the tide of the people. You can't tweet your way out of mishandling of the pandemic, which is the lesson American President Donald Trump learned. You can't PR your way uh, uh, with mishandling of the pandemic. You can't even 
uh, control the social media so that and uh, do the full scale assault on the truth because that will come to to bite your back as as putin is witnessing now in russia exporting and sowing this this uh, Assault on truth across the globe actually came due to the fact that yeah, now you have a majority of Russians who believe this propaganda and that don't want to be vaccinated, regardless of how well organized or oppressive state is. So taking a look at this, we will see more of the people power movements in the months and year to come. We'll see more of the incumbents, whether democratical or, or autocratical, being challenged by this. And all of this will be will be probably led by more horizontal, more related to the trigger, more local owned and less hierarchical nonviolent movements across the globe. Uh, looking into human rights and democracy, uh, these prospects are not bad. The more people you involved, and the history teaches us that, uh, the better the chances for success and durable social change. With that do, I wish you uh, the rest of the panel very successful. I hope this is something that will tickle your minds in order to get a productive discussion. Once again, sorry not to be with you and let's wish democracy defenders across the globe all luck. Okay, thank you, Sergio. Uh, we're actually going to, I'm going to skip the, the very long-winded uh, introductions that I had uh, for everybody, but very briefly online, we're going to be joined by uh, Martina Smutsladova, who is, um, who is an international public law expert who will be joining the panel. We also have with us Tomislav Kurzovsky, who's a Macedonian journalist who's had his own experiences, uh, some quite difficult uh, with, with investigative reporting. Uh, we have also with us <clears throat> Rafael Traskowski, who is the mayor of uh, Warsaw and was a candidate for the president, uh, presidency of Poland. And Daniel Hegedusz, who is a transatlantic fellow for Central Europe at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. So I would like to ask, um, uh, first, let's, I guess, start off with Martina, if you, if you can hear us, can you please make your opening remarks? Thank you very much. You hear me, you see me, yes. Yes. Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great honor and pleasure to take part at the Budapest Forum and to contribute with the international perspective to these challenging issues. Defeating authoritarianism. How can international law and international community aid? Already in 1948, the representatives of our governments worldwide have consented in the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that it is essential if a man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. The principle of rule of law reflects the Latin maxim ubi societas ibi ius, meaning law is indispensable to every society. Should its members coexist in some viable, balanced, and functioning mode, a lowest common denominator is the cornerstone. The basic pillars of the rule of law include, first, the power of the state cannot be exercised arbitrarily. It means that laws must be prospective, accessible, and clear. Secondly, the law must also apply to the sovereign and the instruments of the state with an independent institution such as judiciary to serve as a guarantee. Thirdly, law must apply to all persons equally without prejudicial discrimination. Although the state is sovereign, including over the mode of implementation of the rule of law, the state sovereignty is not absolute. It is limited by international legal order and principles, international treaties, general international customary rules, including use against norms, and rules deriving from its membership in international organizations. It is via these norms that international community can intervene in order to help to defeat authoritarianism. On one hand, it can resort to sanctions, retortions, and reprisals directly against the perpetrators of injustice or threat to peace, and to assist the bottom-up pressure in that country. The targeted sanctions and other restrictive measures imposed on Belarus, Myanmar, and Venezuela serve an example. Furthermore, uh, international community can resort to peacekeeping operations or use of force and humanitarian intervention as ultima ratio. The Territorial Administration ensured by UN in Kosovo or the humanitarian intervention led by NATO, authorized by the UN Security Council in 2011 in Libya, confirm the assistance of international community with the rule of law. On the other hand, 
United Nations law provides direct access to criminal justice and international human rights protections. Good examples are the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, prosecuting the war crimes committed during the Yugoslav wars, that convicted, for example, Karadzic or Mladic, and for Rwanda, both leading to the establishment of the International Criminal Court in The Hague, vested with the competence to address international crimes committed intra alia by authoritarian regimes. The Rohingya crisis in Myanmar, where rule of law failed, submitted both to ICC and to International Court of Justice, surprisingly by Gambia, serves another good example. Moreover, some of these tools illustrate well the bottom-up approach on the international level. NGOs, representatives of uh, civil society and individuals can launch criminal proceedings against foreign individuals, including members of an authoritarian government in the name of universal jurisdiction. For example, Ms. Manchu, Nobel Peace Prize holder, together with a group of Spanish and Guatemalan NGOs, succeeded with her lawsuit in Spain in 2005 before the Constitutional Court against Guatemalan government officials. Similarly, a lawsuit concerning the Rohingya crisis has been filed recently in Argentina. Moreover, even if the respective state has not submitted to the regional human rights courts, such as the Strasbourg Court, the individuals and NGOs can turn to the treaty-based bodies of United Nations, expert committees that monitor implementation of the core international human rights treaties, such as the Human Rights Committee or the Committee Against Torture. It means that international law does offer tools to contribute to the defeat of regimes and rulers, undermining the principles of rule of law. It is just important for the civil society and foreign governments to actively utilize them. At the end, let me mention briefly another perspective. Besides the legal norms, I always tell to my students of international law, if you want to understand the world affairs, break it down to individuals, human beings. It's about psychology at the top international level, after all. It's all about people. State is not an artificial institution, some stage set to hide behind. It's about concrete individuals at the reign. Rule of law sets the necessary formal limits and guarantees of coexistence, but with a little hyperbole, the true way to international peace leads through upbringing, education, informedness, and psychology or rather psychotherapy, and lies in the roots of human characters. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Martina, and we will then bounce to Tomislav. Uh, on the beginning, I said some words in Hollywood and in Berlin and in Italy, in Venice, are gathered actors and directors, the films Jet Set. Today here in Budapest, are gathered the democratic jet set. And I'm, whole, I'm so happy because that I'm part of this event. I sincerely hoped that here among the guests, I would see a person known to me, a Macedonian citizen with a Hungarian passport, a figure from justice but he is gone. This is a guaranteeing of democracy and there is probably no place for it. In my opening statement, I want to say a few words. In fact, I actually want to say what I wrote in my book, Life in a Box, about the days spent in a jail. As long as you trust others' opinions and accept them as a fact. You will be their addicts and uh, hostages. Get rid of other people's opinions. Don't uh, let them create you a blockade uh, that will never allow you to research, to reach your decided goal and you will never live your dreams. 
don't blame yourself for all the troubles that have happened to you because this is uh, the only way you will learn to write your future just as you think and wish no one will ever have power over you get rid of all your conviction that happiness and success are not for you that you are not good enough to release your uh, ideas the dream is yours you are special you are unique listen to your inner voice the minute it can you rule our the majority when i say minority i mean on the leaders of the regime the goal is uh, somewhere far away but we can only reach if we walk towards in uh, on well trained pants we must be with each other the fear of the black days now uh, us on the door and uh, will knock as long as our coverage does not open the inuricis excite after the world was created it is difficult to win but that does uh, not mean that we should give up searching for justice or even more hoping to close our eyes and to be silent of selfless. You just have to do the first step. Each one is the answer. Okay. Thank you, Tomislav. Uh, Rafal, you could share your thoughts with us. Yes, well, hello, good morning. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be with you. Sretan sam što sam z vama my friends from Macedonia and, uh, and, and Serbia. Uh, just a few opening remarks. Well, uh, it is we live in an unusual world whereby the mayors and the regional and local governments have to consolidate their powers and start cooperating in face of the uh, regimes that are starting to be more and more authoritarian. I don't think that we were prepared for this because, you know, we as Europeans, we've been dealing with uh, autocracies around the world quite often. And of course, you know, uh, some of us, we were in the autocratic, non-democratic system from which we were able to uh, free ourselves more than 30 years ago. However, we were not uh, ready for anything that is happening now in quite a lot of European countries where there is more and more populism, where some of our governments are becoming increasingly authoritarian. And I don't think that we are very good at, at counter reacting this salami tactics. Uh, and I'm quite aware that I'm in Budapest using that parable. Or as we say in Polish, where, you know, a frog is being boiled in cold water and the frog does not know that the water gets warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer once it's too late. And that's what's happening in some of our countries, because of course, uh, Hungary and Poland are still democratic countries, but uh, these democracies are flawed and many of our freedoms uh, are being taken away. Most of the institutions that used to be independent are no longer independent. And uh, it is very difficult to draw the line where democracy ends. And one day we might uh, end up or wake up in a world in which some of those damages will be reversible. And of course, there is a great responsibility on all of us not to let it happen and that's why you know local and regional governments suddenly the mayors started to co collaborate i mean that's not normal we shouldn't be doing things together i mean we have other jobs that are very important but it turns out that we must because we are the ones who actually can uh, develop tools that are going to put a stop or at least make it more difficult for the authoritarian regimes to become even more authoritarian that's why we co collaborate. That's why we are expanding the, the Pact of the Free Cities. What can we do? I mean, the problem is that, you know, the international institutions and the European Union are not really well fit for dealing with such situations. 
you know, our member states signed uh, the treaties. Uh, and uh, there is, of course, a European Commission and, and most importantly, the European Court of Justice to enforce them. But we are not ready for that situation, for the democratic states to become less and less democratic. I mean, some of the instruments that we have, I mean, let's put it, uh, put it uh, bluntly, are not very well fit for that situation. Just look at the instrument of tying the rule of law to the uh, European funds. I mean, of course, we need to defend the values. We need to defend the rule of law. I mean, there is no question about it. But we, the mess, we are in a schizophrenic situation that, you know, our populations, our cities will be penalized for the crazy governments that we have in place. Now, what can we do? I mean, first of all, I think that we can set the example and uh, help the civic society to develop. I mean, as progressively, some of the uh, institutions are being dismantled, the independent institutions are, as non-governmental organizations are being attacked, as universities are being expelled, as free media is being shackled. I mean, the more responsibility on us. Somehow, I will submit to you that populists rarely win in cities and in regional governments because we are close to the people and people make somehow more uh, effective and more responsible decisions when choosing their local leaders because they want uh, for the things to be done and they want leaders who are effective. Uh, and populists are not known for, for, for being very effective. So what we need to do, we need to help and galvanize the civic society. That's what we're doing. We're helping all the NGOs that have been eliminated from the public life, by the or that the government wants to eliminate from the public life. We are helping in education. We're develop, developing programs that are teaching how to, be, uh, how to be tolerant, how to resolve problems, how to approach a reality whereby we have increasingly problems uh, from sifting the truth from manipulation. I mean, that's the things that we can do and should do. Of course, the central governments do not like it. That's why they're trying to take away our prerogatives, take away our, our money. But that's our responsibility. And finally, we need to set an example. I mean, if we really want to be uh, effective in, in fighting populists, we need to engage the, the, the youth. We need to focus on the real priorities. Look at the media. I mean, most of the time, at least I am asked on the media at home, you know, how would you react to what Mr. X said? Or how would you react to some initiative of the government, which is crazy? Let's focus on what's really needed. Let's focus on fighting climate change. Let's focus on teaching responsibility at schools. Let's focus on health and uh, actually being more quick and effective in times of crises. Let's focus on security of jobs because that's the most important thing that the young people at least tell me when I talk to them after the pandemic. And only through that, through setting an example that things can be done better, that things can be done in a transparent way, that we can focus in an open way on the real priorities, we have, uh, we have a shot at actually uh, convincing people that voting for populist is not the best option possible. Thank you for that, and we'll move on to Daniel. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I feel privileged that I can be part of such a distinguished panel. Um, if I can be both honest and provocative, then then I think I, I don't share the op optimistic approach of, of Mr. Popovich, but please don't call it pessimism. I, I think it's just a kind of healthy realism. Um, if you allow me, I would share my thought in 90 seconds about the state of play between democracy and, and autocracy at the global stage and in Central and Eastern Europe. And in the rest of my time, I would like to highlight three distinct issues, what I really consider to be best practices in a Central and, and Eastern European context. Um, I think if we are frank with each other, there is not too much to celebrate with regard to defeating authoritarianism. During the past couple of years, only two authoritarian regimes were brought to collapse uh, globally, that is Sudan and Algeria. But in none of these cases can we speak about a genuine democratization in the aftermath. The pro-democracy movements mentioned by Mr. Popovich mostly took place in democracies, which means that they can revitalize democracies and potentially in the long term make democracies more resilient to to authoritarian temptations. 
but they can seldom reverse the tide of authoritarianism. And, uh, and I think the, the examples of Belarus and Hong Kong can serve as very important and very sad reminders in that regard. Um, if there is a lesson learned from the Arab Spring, then it is that bringing down authoritarian regimes is a necessary but not a sufficient condition of democratization. Um, in Central and Eastern Europe, of course, there are a couple of countries where illiberal trends could be reversed, like Slovakia, Romania, recently Bulgaria, although the Bulgarian situation is still very much in, uh, in limbo. But it remains to be seen whether these democratic successes are, are solid or temporary. Because uh, just to uh, disagree with Mr. Czaskowski, uh, I think democracy is not the only game in town anymore in Central and Eastern Europe. We have very distinct illiberal trends in, in every single country uh, in the region. And if we take a look on the spareheads of, uh, of illiberalism, uh, Poland and Hungary, then these countries are very much on the authoritarian track. But as I mentioned, there are indeed best practices in Central and Eastern Europe, which can be highlighted and must be highlighted. I would like to offer three of them, and I hope that we can elaborate uh, on the details later in the discussion. Um, I think first, the organic electoral cooperation between CSOs, civil society organizations, and pro-democracy forces can be considered as a kind of best practice. Uh, one could see this phenomenon during the 2019 Hungarian municipal elections, but also during the 2019 Slovakian presidential and 2020 Slovakian uh, parliamentary elections, which demonstrated that civil society organization can play a very important role uh, in, in candidate nomination, in mobilization, campaigning, and they can provide extra legitimacy and extra mobilization resources for pro-democracy forces. Of course, such partisanship of the civil society is not sustainable in the long run because it undermines the civil society's appeal that they are independent. But in the heat of a neck and neck electoral race, it can provide a distinct advantage for pro-democracy forces and therefore I consider it to be a kind of best practice. Uh, the second best practice is, in my eyes, the successful mobilization of diaspora communities. And, uh, and the Romanian pro-democracy forces are, are the true masters of, of that art. Uh, Romanian diaspora played a crucial role uh, during the 2018 uh, Romanian anti-corruption protest, but also uh, in the context of the 2019 Romanian presidential elections. And we have had also some, dist some sporadic forms of diaspora, mobiliz diaspora mobilization also in Hungary uh, under the December 2018 labor law protests. But it remains a matter of fact that the 300,000 Hungarian citizens who have left this country since 2010 constitute a very important electoral pool for the opposition parties. And I think, therefore, conducting proper election campaign in the diaspora communities and helping the members of the diaspora communities that they can live with the right to vote in practical terms is an important task both for the opposition parties and for civil society organizations, both home and abroad. And I'm pretty much sure that the two million large Polish diaspora has the very same importance for the Polish opposition parties as well. And coming to my, my last point, I think the third best practice is what we could simply call, and I know that it's very provocative, good polarization. When elections can be reframed as a sort of referendum or plebiscite over uh, an authoritarian, populist, uh, illiberal, whatever, strongman. Uh, the buzzword is often not democracy, but anti-corruption, like we could see in the case of the 2020 Slovakian parliamentary election or the 2021 Bulgarian election. But I think it's not important that the campaign should be centered around a single message. What is important that the campaign message is used, may that be pro-democracy, anti-corruption, social welfare and redistributive issues, reinforce the very same single cleavage in the political landscape, which is being either for or against the authoritarian strongman. I'm aware of it that polarization is very often perceived as a sort of negative phenomenon which undermines the stability of existing democracies. It's true. 
but polarization can also undermine the stability of autocratizing regimes. And it can be a genuine task of pro-democracy forces to mitigate the negative impact of polarization if they are in government. But meanwhile, they are contesting authoritarians. I think they have to learn how to exploit this instrument properly, at least as much as their populist counterparts do. So thank you so much. That would be my keynote at the beginning, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you for that. So we've heard um, external and domestic factors that may contribute to um, you know defeating authoritarianism, or at least curbing it in some sense. Um, Sergio mentioned something very interesting uh, in, in talking about these horizontal, uh, these horizontal nonviolent movements, um, decentralization triggered by singular issues, um, the the capacity to grow at at great speed, and then he he kind of concludes this idea by saying that one of the things he he finds so amazing about these movements that he's seeing around the world is the ability to draw in young people. Um, we have talked about international law. We have talked about uh, the EU dealing with member states. We have talked about diaspora. Uh, I think one of the key things to talk about here is maybe how does the local population of a country um, contribute to change and within that, the youth. And um, particularly in this part of the world, how does emigration change the dynamic? How is this? How does this make uh, Serge's view a little bit more, how would I say, how does it weaken that argument? I mean, yeah, I mean, well, I'll, I'll talk about the youth. This is incredibly important because uh, the young people are incredibly and increasingly political, but they're not party political. And that's the problem that we are dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, in our countries. That's why I organized this campus, the future of Poland, where we invited a thousand of, of young people who were uh, somehow involved socially and politically, 80% of which had nothing to do with, uh, with political parties. And to be honest, many of them did not particularly like my party. Uh, but the idea was to create a space where we can actually galvanize, galvanize people and, and uh, talk about consolidating our work in uh, fighting authoritarianism also outside of political parties. Because the problem, at least in Poland, the problem was that peace, the, the governing party won the elections, but it won the elections not only by strengthening the political party, but they were creating think tanks, they were creating special web platforms, they were creating discussion clubs, and so on and so forth. And of course, now they are channeling money to, to many of those organizations. They, they created foundations. For example, the, the guy who was a justice minister, the most controversial figure, for years he had a foundation where he was you know, getting a lot of money in order to, uh, to actually indoctrinate uh, prosecutors. And when they got into power like that, he had 200 you know, uh, prosecutors ready uh, and formed in a special way to carry his crazy ideas forward. We're not doing it uh, on, on the liberal side, or we're not defending some of those institutions. So that's the question. I mean, you know, involve the young people by allowing them to, to create the space in which we, we can, we can uh, collaborate and, and fight the regime on many different uh, issues on, on, for example, you know, fighting climate change or, or uh, getting a higher uh, voter turnout or uh, watching the election so that they're not rigged and so on and so forth. That's that's the way forward. You you have to, as we say in Polish, play the different pianos at the same time. Not only focus on on strengthening your own political party. You need to do that because without political parties, you're not going to win the elections. But you need to do more than that. And of course, local and regional government is also important because we need to consolidate local and regional government cooperate because many of our friends are simply independent, but they have a huge impact on what's going on in 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 uh, uh, in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I will be very brief. I'm not, I'm not an expert of, of youth mobilization, but I think the, the main issue is, at least from a Hungarian perspective, that, that um, the youth age groups can be mostly mobilized through single issue uh, protest movements, like we have seen, for example, in the case of the internet tax uh, demonstrations in, in Hungary. And of course, the main question for the opposition parties is how can this single issue protest turned into kind of sustainable anti-system dynamic or, or protest. Um, concerning the Hungarian situation, I think the Hungarian opposition is, is not really in a worst case situation because there are opposition parties who have a good appeal uh, in, in the ranks of the younger generation, like for example, Jobbik or, or Momentum. 
but it's a matter of fact that that a broader part of, of this age group is uh, is not necessarily or doesn't necessarily have strong party alliances, uh, and these these neutral younger voters are are not easy to get or or to reach out uh, to them. And of course, coming back to the first part of your question, definitely that sort of emigration, uh, what we have touched upon, weakened the electoral pool uh, of the opposition parties, especially because better educated uh, and, and younger people have, have left the, uh, the country. Uh, it's not necessarily predetermined that they are, they are lost. But that would require extra resources and extra work from the Hungarian opposition parties that uh, that they can be mobilized and that their votes can or that their ballots can be cast for for the opposition parties. I know that there are Hungarian opposition parties who are who are working on on the issue and have some diaspora organizations as well, at least in larger cities like London or or Berlin, the city when, when where I am coming from. But uh, but generally, I think these. Uh, these success, successes are sporadic and not systemic, and uh, it's far from being a kind of game changer in the Hungarian election contest. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I do have a, a public service announcement. We only have 15 minutes left for this panel, and I was told I should open up to uh, discussions from the audience, and I would very much like to give anyone who would like to ask a question here the opportunity to engage with our panelists and also with, uh, with Martina, who's on the, on the computer. So going once, going twice. Right over there. And then let's see after. Uh, hello, my name is Henry Varga. I'm from Nitra, Slovakia. Um, I'd like to reflect on uh, on Mr. Hegedush, on the rather controversial thing you said uh, in your first uh, speech uh, about, the, about the positive polarization. Uh, I think Slovakia is a good example uh, that it doesn't really work uh, because the, the prime minister that, um, uh, that came after the positive polarization in the in the campaign didn't succeed and he had to step down after less than a year and uh, it turned out that in the campaign he was very effective he was very effective as an opposition politician but as a leader he just just didn't didn't make it he just wasn't the type of person as he was always uh, negative he was always in opposition he just didn't didn't make it to to um, pull positive themes and lead the country. So that is maybe just one example. So it doesn't have to be a rule, but Slovakia is not a good example of positive polarization. Was there a question there? It's just a reflection on Okay, the... great. Let's see. Hi, Blas, uh, see you. Uh, I'm sorry for my pronunciation, uh, Mr. Drakowski, uh, I have a question. You, uh, and this is actually to all of you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, this uh, the policies of EU that uh, try to uh, penalize uh, illiberal governments, penalize actually society, penalize uh, the cities, uh, and uh, there are of course uh, uh, several ideas how to go around that, how uh, to uh, channel, for example, resources from EU. Uh, directly uh, to cities or to firms, but uh, can cities do in this EU uh, something against it? Because I, I know that this uh, started ages ago and this uh, doesn't really work. So this question actually to all of you. Well, I mean, what I said is is that the instruments that the EU has are not the most effective simply because you know no one in the EU thought that they would be needed, so they are as if uh, invented on the run. And I've said that it is a double-edged sword, you know, the, the, the question of, of linking the rule of law with, uh, with blocking the money. Maybe there is no other way around, but I'm just saying that from a perspective, especially of a mayor, this is not the best solution. That's why we started fighting for some money to be channeled directly to local and regional government through pan-European programs. And I always give those examples that, you know, the European Union can simply say, we remove the diesel powered buses from all the streets of the European cities and we do it without the intermediary of a central government. We do it directly with the cities. So, for example, we do retrofitting of the biggest 20 buildings in Budapest, Warsaw, Madrid, and so on and so with EU money. And this is a win-win situation. People would see, you know, we talk about reductions, we talk about levels, neutrality, no one understands it. 
And here the European Union would have direct programs. It would help the local and regional governments. And we're talking about five, seven percent of the money. So there are smarter ways in which you can actually help local and regional governments and in which you can show that there are smart ideas in order to go around the national governments, at least in some cases, like we do with non-governmental organizations, that we do not use the governments as an intermediary. And we should do more of that. And we've been fighting it for the past two years. How effective it is? Not very effective because, unfortunately, people do not want to change their set ways. And the people in the commission are saying, oh, yeah, changing procedure, you know, and member states will not. Uh, it's like that. OK, now COVID also contributed to that because we couldn't make our forceful arguments face to face. Now we're doing them, and I uh, have a promise from my colleagues that they will take that issue you know, as their own and try to push it, because we need some political entrepreneurship in, in order to push some of those ideas. So I remain hopeful, even though we quite late in the process. But finally, last, sentence, last thing, this is where we need to be tough, because there's a huge money from Recovery Fund, and the governments, authoritarian governments, want to use it for political ends. They want to use political criteria by distributing the money. And here the European Union has the instruments in, and it has to use them to be tough. There's got to be transparent criteria how the money is being distributed because first of all, we cannot waste it because we need to fulfill the priorities of the European Union and we need to do it in a way which is not political because then we are simply helping the regime instead of helping the people. Tony? Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to react on the, on the Slovakian case. We disagree. Um, and I think Slovakia is a fantastic positive example, uh, at least from a Hungarian perspective, for two good reasons. First, I know no one who would better assent on the fact that the Slovakian government will survive a year and we still have this government. In spite of the fact that it even survived the change of the prime minister, and uh, of course, it, it has had the main purpose to bring down the illiberal regime or government of Mr. Fico, and it succeeded with that. And from a Hungarian perspective, I think, I think it's again a, a very interesting case because it shows that a very broad coalition between progressive and even radical right parties, Smerodina, can be stable. Can be stable. Uh, so I, I think we have, as Hungarians, we have uh, learned a lot from, from the Slovakian case. And, uh, and coming to the question of, of Lotzi, um, I, I think the issue that, uh, that EU funds are tied uh, to rule of law and how it impacts domestic politics, it's simply a question and a subject of framing. And it's not predetermined that national governments always succeed with a rally around the frag narrative. It's just a question how opposition parties perform uh, in this case and whether they can spread the discourse that look it's practically the responsibility of our government that we are cut from these uh, we, uh from these resources and it should simply change the cost benefits calculations of that government so it's not a punishment for the country it's not a punishment for for the population if the autocratizing national governments uh change it, its minds but i think two issues would be required to, to successfully reframe uh, this narrative. The first one that, of course, uh, opposition parties should have a larger media impact. And the second one that the European Commission, who is practically a player in this game, uh, should also communicate in a frank and straightforward way. But of course, that's not possible due to the role conception of the European Commission and simply from the fact how the permanent representations of the European Commission are functioning in the individual member states. I think one of the most important change at European level would be that permanent representations cannot be led by a national. That, that would be the, the starting point, because that is a representation uh, of the European Commission in the country and not a simple liaison office between the government and the European Commission. But um, as I said, it's not predetermined. It's a question of, uh, of narratives and framing. Thanks, Danny. We had a question right here, madam. Hi, my name is Tamara Tripic. I'm coming from Serbia, and Serbia is now well known as captured country. And uh, although uh, I had experience fighting Milosevic, and that's why I sent hugs to Srđo Popović, but now what I figure out that there is also one other angle uh, in uh, tackling this issue is that, uh, you know, after a while, citizens are getting used to live in undemocratic conditions. It's like uh, women living in a 
violenced marriages, uh, they create their uh, my, uh, micro world and uh, everything there uh, become normal after uh, after a while. So we have to bear in mind that after, for example, in Serbia, nine years, people are used to live in undemocratic uh, conditions. That's why I understand what happened in Belarus. And that's something we have to find a way how to wake up uh, people. Also, uh, the other thing I would like you to comment, and maybe we can use it in my country, is that the mistrust between stakeholders in the opposition. Uh, uh, how to rebuild uh, trust between CSOs, uh, politicians from opposition, movements, uh, green movements, uh, how to build that uh, bridge. Uh, we are now trying, my organization in Serbia, to have that open discussions around Serbia directly with, between stakeholders and ordinary citizens. But if you have any ideas, I would appreciate. Thank you. I think we'll take one more question and then we'll answer this all, uh, all together here. Sir, you had your hand up. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Ralf Leonhardt from Austria. I'm a journalist. Um, we have here a cluster of progressive uh, mayors from basically conservative populist countries. And this shows that uh, there is a division between the cities and, and the rural areas. Um, because without the votes from the rural areas, those governments wouldn't be in power. So what what can the cities do in order to get uh, the rural communities into the boat pro-democracy and um, convince them that this is the way to go? Even in my country, in Austria, we have a, a division between Vienna and uh, most of the uh, the provinces. Thank you. So just to just to recap these two questions, we had the analogy of, uh, you know, people in, uh, in in captured or authoritarian countries becoming increasingly uh, numb, perhaps as a, in an abusive marriage, mistrust of the opposition uh, within the opposition CSOs and what can cities do uh, to get rural communities and onto the pro democracy boat. Yeah, well, uh, when it comes to people get, getting used to, I mean, at least in Poland, you know, yes, some people are getting used to it, but there will be a tipping point. You know, we are good at rebelling against bad authorities. I mean, that's our history. So I'm, I remain hopeful. When it comes for the opposition parties to talk to each other, that's the problem. That at the end of the day, people feel, well, you know, there is more and more autocratic tendencies, but it's a still still a democracy. And so on. if it's still a, a democratic regime, then it's very difficult to say to the all, all, all opposition parties, let's do one you know, one block and let's fight because everyone is, you know, still competing and so on. At the end of the day, we need to be smart enough to at least create, in my opinion, one list with, of course, autonomy of different parties, because otherwise it will be very difficult to win with the government. And and finally, your question, a very good one. I mean, the problem that we are having, like in my presidential elections, was that I won in all of the cities, but it was 70% 30, okay? In some of the rural areas, I lost 90% to 10 so it's a question of reversing that we it will be immensely difficult for the opposition to win in a, in those cities but we need to at least change the proportion it cannot be 90 to 10 and i could you know i would need 10 minutes to explain why it is so because it is because of some of the mistakes that we made when we were governing but mostly because of the crazy propaganda that the government is spending billions on and you know like in hungary the people are cut off from independent the TV channels in some of the rural areas, also in Poland, the role of the church, I could go on and on and on. Now, what we need to do, and I think that self-government, local and regional government, in a sense, is an answer, because we have very strong local and regional uh, leaders in some of the most difficult areas, which are not uh, you know, party members of the opposition, but we're independent. We need to collaborate with them. We need to, uh, we need to go there and try to talk to them because they know what arguments to use, to whom to talk to, and so on and so forth. And when they are courageous, then the, the, the end result is different. There is, for example, one or two counties in, in the most difficult region of Poland where, you know, we get usually 20, 15% of votes. And in this county, we got 35 or 40. 
just because there was an independent mayor who was explaining to the people that what they hear on public TV is not always true and inviting us to talk to the people. And, and you know, when they saw us, they were okay, you are not really a devil internet. You're a normal person. It's not so easy. So an outreach, outreach and outreach, because, you know, many of the opposition party, parties are not working there. You know, they, they have been eliminated and they don't go there because not always is it very pleasant. So we need to, you know, get our act together and 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 actually be active there and and through the cooperation with local government and with the young people that that we, we decided to talk to and galvanize Tomislav, do you have any ideas on this thank you very much it's a hard to understand although madness that happened in Macedonia, it's even more difficult to explain. I myself, uh, I myself uh, don't manage to collect uh, all the information for those uh, who escalated with the speed of a thrilling trailer. It is impossible to explain uh, the behavior of government official uh, while assuming that it's a matter of hosting for uh, rational and responsible people. For them, uh, there is uh, no red line that they cannot pass. They have their true and uh, where the way of uh, enforcing justice. The creators of the economic reforms, probably in moments uh, of the ascension from the great success, that Macedonia has become economic world power, a thing that they are allowed uh, and can do it. It is uh, freaking to see what uh, lighting uh, distorts human lives and uh, these uh, entire families and uh, with which is uh, the comment of the loss of human life. Criminal acts uh, are the government, the parliament, the police, and the judiciary in Macedonia. Uh, this continuity of the system has been created. This long uh, compromised uh, situation, otherwise uh, most uh, significant in a parliamentary have been uh, involved, publicly and uh, uh, the slogan of corruption was a great as never before. The prime minister and his idols were like the cannibals. The minister almost all alone are kleptomanks. Thank you. Uh, Danny, do you have any final words? And I think we'll wrap up this panel. Um, very, very briefly, although it's neither convincing nor motivating. Um, um, I think regaining trust is a cumulative process which simply requires time. In 2013 in Hungary, no one had expected that one day independent civil society organizations will cooperate with candidates of the Hungarian Socialist Party. Six years later, it happened. Sorry for being provocative, in 2016 in Poland, no one expected that one day PO and Donald Tusk will be again the crystallizing point of the Polish opposition. It happened. Why? Because I think um, um, citizens are wise enough to being able to choose the lesser evil if this lesser evil is offering a kind of hope. And, and if there is hope, and this hope appears to be genuine, then it is rebuilding a kind of natural trust in this political option. Thank you. Well, thank you to everyone. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the rest of the uh, forum.